I want to start my talk by showing you three uh, images and citation. First, a citation from a lecture by the poet Dmitri Prigov, dated 1985. In this lecture, Prigov asked his colleague Vladimir Sarokin whether time wasn't right for a Novaya Iskrinist, written with capital N and E. That is, a new writing and speaking mode which would allow artists to speak clearly, sincerely and directly. I'm citing Prigov, and you see the Russian on the, on the PowerPoint, but without forgetting the entire scorching experience of what we have been through. And uh, Prigov is referring here to the Soviet experience. After all, Prigov concluded, uh, ideologia nužna, ideali nužni. My second image images are screenshots from Canadian artist Jason Monbert's video performance, The New Sincerity, conducted in 2001. This is a short video, roughly five minutes, of a somewhat dreary party of beautiful, hipsterish, well-off and clearly bored young creative professionals. You can watch it online if you want, it's fully accessible online. The video comments on celebrity identity and on social survival in the art world today, and in the words of one critic, um, in doing so it invents a new sincerity out of constructive irony. My last starting image is a screenshot from the weblog of Russian-speaking blogger Flippy754, with photos of two girls at a Starbucks cafe in Moscow. Flippy754 posted them in March 2009 and added this comment. Welcome everyone at this, well it's not just a talk, but it's really also for me a presentation of this, of my new book called Sincerity After Communism, A Cultural History. Um, I didn't bring books with me, so there's no shop afterwards, but I have some flyers, so if you want, <laughs> there is like a semi-shop, you can grab a flyer afterwards. It's a book that was published earlier this year by Yale University Press, and I'm as, uh, just as delighted as Olga that the Dutch Institute offered me the chance to tell you about it here. Tonight I squeeze this book's main argument into um, a little bit more than half an hour talk with pictures and to make sure that in that time I offer you more than a mere overview, I've chosen to zoom in on one chapter. But as you will see, um, I'm not going to talk about one case study, but I emphatically embed that chapter's findings in uh, a story about the book's overarching argument. Um, so I want to talk about this book. Sincerity after communism traces a trend to frame cultural and social practices as markers of a new zeitgeist, one embodied in the slogan New Sincerity, or in Russian Novaya Iskernes. Now, before I give my take on this slogan, I'm quite keen on hearing what you think of it, because I know that many people have lots of thoughts about this phrase. So I wonder, would anyone here, you don't have to, but is anyone willing to tell me what you think that this phrase stands for? Можно на русском? Что такое новый искренность? But it's in English, right? In order to be more sincere, we can use English, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it makes I, more sense. Yeah, you can I, use both. Yeah, I, I would say that it's issue how to market sincerity, how to imitate it, how to create image that you're sincere. Mm -hmm. And I work as a journalist, so this is what I do almost every day. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting yeah. response, yeah. and we'll that. Maybe one more response. Is, yeah. A longing for something more, for something authentic, because of the idea that we're drifting away from, from something true. Mm -hmm. So a response to, to something, yeah. right? The, the, it's, it's dialectic, and we're going to return to that. Maybe one last response. Okay, no, sorry, I'm sort of, I'm overdoing This is enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. These are two very helpful responses. So new sincerity is a phrase that between the mid-1980s and today has been used by people from a variety of social, local and professional backgrounds to typify what you could call a novel philosophy of life. Um, and I clustered some examples on this slide. Uh, bloggers, curators, scholars, writers, philosophers, marketers, journalists, film reviewers, they use this phrase to typify um, uh, artworks, poems, films, political movements, cartoons, etc. And in doing so, they plea for reviving sincerity. And I'm citing one expert's definition of this term. So, sincerity, that's the assessment by addressees that the expression by addressers are true representations of their feelings and emotional state. So, what this says, put less hermetically, is sincerity is the quality of remaining true to oneself. 
For motives of a new sincerity, this is why I liked your answer very much, you sort of hint at that, they do not advertise sincerity as such. They adopt a dialectical take on the concept. The new sincerity is always a sincerity that comes after or responds to an existing condition. The postmodern condition, for instance, as in Prigov's case, recent shifts in politics, or our hypermediatized society. Mombert's new sincerity, for instance, so this video, um, responds to the ubiquity of audiovisual media in present day life. More often than not, however, advocates of a new sincerity use this phrase to signal a move beyond postmodernism. So this notion of postmodernism is very relevant to the discussion. Or rather, they say that it's a move beyond a set of features that they consider postmodern. Relativism, cynicism, a move away from grand narratives and ideologies. Those are some uh, features that people call postmodern and they say the new sincerity allows us to move beyond that. Some employ the phrase uh, densely theoretically. Brigov is a case in point. When he talks about new sincerity, he's talking about aesthetics <coughs> and rhetoric. Others merely drop the phrase as a social identity or lifestyle marker. Well, picture is tiny, but you'll remember this picture, I think. So this blog post that I showed you is a case in point. Uh, here, the new sincerity is a sort of slogan for a lifestyle or almost a fashion statement. So what I don't want to do, neither here nor in my book, is mould all of these different voices into one exhaustive theoretical model. My central question is not what exactly is the new sincerity. You're not going to find out tonight. <laughs> There's not going to be one answer. Um, neither do I ask is or isn't the new sincerity the leading cultural trend following postmodernism. There have been others who tried to tackle that question before me and they've done so uh, very helpfully, but these are not the questions that I try to answer. What intrigues me instead is another inquiry and this is the question what do discussions about the need to revive sincerity tell us about contemporary cultural production and consumption processes? Or, put more plainly, what do sincerity, anxiety, so this concern, are we sincere or not, what does it teach us, discussions about that question, what, what do these discussions teach us about present day public cultural life, and post-socialist life in particular. And that's the question that I want to look at with you tonight. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll do so by first saying a few words in general about the book, then zooming in a bit on its three central chapters, and then zooming yet a little bit more on its second chapter. But first I want to zoom out and look at the broader discussions within which new sincerity discourse operates. Um, what we see is that pleas to reanimate sincerity are, um, they don't stand on themselves, but they are part of a larger polemic. This is the debate on a new cultural era that we are allegedly entering, in which new modes of being or speaking, new sincerity, but also new seriousness, post-realism, are purportedly replacing existing ones. So once again, it's not my point that I'm, I'm saying this is, this is all true, but I'm interested in, I'm also not saying it's not true, but I'm interested in this discourse. Um, within this hodgepodge of different tags for a new age, the discourse on a new sincerity has become a particularly resonant popular catchphrase. Over the course of the 2000s, internationally renowned media, the New York Times, the Zeit, the Moscow Times, all resorted to this phrase. You see two examples here. In reviews like these of recent and social, uh, social and cultural developments, reviewers treat the new sincere turn as a self-evident given. Now, in my book, um, I show that one place where discussions on a new sincerity have been thriving with force is here, and here I don't mean you know, the, the Dutch Institute, but the post-Soviet post -Soviet Russia. Over the past few years, whenever I ran the phrase Novaya Iskrenes through a blog search, a weblog search, its most recent usage never dated back more than a few days and sometimes hours ago. In 2008, anthropologist Alexei Yuchak considered a post-post-communist sincerity the prime aesthetic mode in contemporary Russian culture. And such eminent cultural commentators as Michal Epstein and Mark Lipovetsky point to the new sincerity as a salient post-conceptualist, late postmodern, or post-postmodern trend. Now, as some of you will know well, this post-Soviet interest in sincerity rhetoric does not come out of the blue. Um, <coughs> and those of you who, who know Russian literary history especially will know that sincerity concerns have a long and rich history there. 
and the term iskranist, and that the term iskranist acquired public buzzword status in the 1950s with this very famous essay, Ab iskranisti in literature, by Vladimir Pomerantsev. This was an essay that paved the way for critical reflection in the Stalin era. I'm not sure to what extent this is extremely familiar to you, but I expect that some of you might not know this essay, so I decided to at least mention it. In my book, I first trace this, this is simply the table of contents of, of the book, I first trace this historical route in an opening chapter, um, and I use existing studies by Lionel Trilling and others to track the historical takes on sincerity of thinkers like Aristotle, Rousseau, or later in Russia, Tolstoy. Um, and what I try to do, <coughs> so I'm not trying to say everything you can about the history of sincerity, but I'm trying to show how their ideas feed present day concerns about sincerity. And then the subsequent three chapters take us to the recent present and to Russia in particular. So I'm focusing on Russia, and in doing so, I'm also using these and other existing studies. Um, to look at how the Russian story overlaps and contrasts with debates about a new sincerity in especially anglophone media and writing. Now, those chapters that I showed you, they trace the route that new sincerity rhetoric travels in Russia between roughly the mid-1980s and today. And the same, in the same chapters, I discern three stages in its post-Soviet genealogy. It starts, this genealogy starts on the brink of the Soviet collapse. I'm just checking if I have another, no, 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 let me go back. It starts on the brink of the Soviet collapse with Dmitry Prigov. Prigov, who was then already a well-known poet, then introduced the new sincerity, as you've seen when I opened my talk, as a novel poetic formula. And he did so not only in this lecture, uh, but he also launched a collection of Samizdat poems with the title Nové Iskrenes and a series of street performances in which he put his theoretical plea into practice. So what Prigov did, uh, I've pasted one example um, here in the, in the PowerPoint, is he made short notes, he printed them out on strips of paper, and in them he blended uh, Soviet-era ideological speech with emotionally called loaded uh, actions, uh, emotionally loaded calls for actions, such as this one. So they always start with people saying "Grajdanya," and then he tells the Grajdanya to do something. So with these notes, Prigov literally took his new sincere credo to the streets. He glued them onto streetlights, walls and fences, and he personally handed them to passers-by. Now, I'm looking at Prigov not for the sake of looking at Prigov, but because he's a central voice in what I see as the first phase in post-Soviet debates on reviving sincerity. And central to this first phase is the nexus between sincerity and memory. For Prigov, as you could see in the examples that I just shared, talk about sincerity is necessarily also talk about the Soviet trauma. And I've really just shown you a few texts by him, but he's written lots of other texts in which the term sincerity is invariably used in connection with that Soviet trauma. And he's not unique in linking the two. In especially the late 1980s and 1990s, uh, Russian talk on a newly sincere condition is, is very tightly interwoven with the ongoing debate on the recent past and the need to cope with the Soviet past. What you see, of course, that debate is still going on. I'm very well aware of that. But especially in the 1980s and 1990s, um, that's a period in which discussions about sincerity become interwoven with that debate. Discussions on Soviet memory are then formative to public reflections on honesty and on artistic self-revelation. And I show in the book how they feed views on a reborn sincerity in writing by, for instance, Nikol Epstein, Natalia Ivanova but also in the visual arts by, uh, with this ex exhibition at New York's Apex Art Gallery in 2006 as prime example. This show was co-curated by Alexander Melamid and Ilya and Emilia Kabakov, and they presented a neo-sincerity, so it's another term, neo-sincerity as an aesthetic strategy for coping with historical traumas, the Soviet experiment, but also the Holocaust and the 9-11 attacks. So what you see is that these and other leading voices in post-Soviet art and writing insist on what I call in the book a curative sincerity. And with that term curative sincerity, I refer to sincerity, so the, the, the ability to speak up uh, and, and to um, uh, sort of to, to have express feelings that match what you actually feel, 
as a near medical tool for dealing with a troubled social memory. So the question, what does it mean to be sincere, becomes caught up here with the need to deal with a troubled social memory. That question, how to digest a traumatic past, reverberates, of course, to this day in pleas to revive sincerity. You still see it pop up um, here and there. But with time, this insistence on memory makes place for other uh, alternatively motivated conceptualizations of sincerity. And here we enter a second phase in post-Soviet debut sincerity. And that phase will sound familiar to you because we're going to talk about marketing among other things. In this phase, the central phase, uh, central question in the debate shifts from how to be sincere after the Soviet trauma to the question how to be sincere in a new economic reality, that of hardcore post-communist capitalism. Now, on this, this is the phase that I want to zoom in uh, a bit more in detail tonight, and I want to do so now by halting at a particularly fierce discussion on sincerity and commodification that around Vladimir Sarokin's trilogy. So there's going to be some Sarokin. I don't know if you're Sarokin Lubitsyli or not, but <laughs> we're going to have to bear with him for a moment now. I'm a Lubitsyli, <laughs> so I don't mind. I presume that everyone here knows Sarokin, uh, and some of you may also know that until roughly the late, 19, late 1990s, his work was mainly read in the terms that dominate this study. Oh, I'm sorry, the picture is because of my words there. Uh, which is play, demythologization, deconstruction, metadiscursivité is the word in the title here. So those are the terms in which scholars started reading Sorokin's work. That situation uh, changes with the Trilogia, his set of three historical novels, Lot, uh, Put, Bro, and uh, 23,000, yeah on a pseudognostic sect whose representatives awaken new members by beating their chests with magic ice hammers. Mm -hmm. Starting from the first novel's publication in 2002, reactions to the trilogia exemplify what Dirk Uffelman calls the topos of a new Sarokin. What you then see is that readers say, oh wait, the new Sarokin is releasing page turners at a best-selling publisher. And reviewers are saying, hey, the new Sarokin is exchanging language play for stories about, admittedly somewhat freaky, people of flesh and blood. And critics are saying, oh, the new Sarokin is reviving a familiar literary motif, that of being true to oneself. His new narrative, um, and they were right, because his new narrative very persistently opposed out of body to inner soul and mind to heart. And it classically highlighted the latter, the soul, the heart, as good poles. It introduced sectarians who awakened and communicated with their hearts, who advocated the truth, so who in short promoted total sincerity. And the text highlights this concept when a prospective member's hesitation is called a defense from sincerity. Zashita is So the trilogy, in short, foregrounded the language of the heart. In doing so, it revolved around a motif that sat uneasily with the postmodern or I should say, Moscow conceptualist philosophy that shaped some of his early work. And that is the motif of unmediated expression. The trilogy smacked of a career break, and Sarokin's public self-fashioning of the time reinforced that impression. In a famous open letter, he implored the trilogy readers to forget <coughs> about deconstruction. In explaining its poetics, he employed a classical vocabulary of artistic sincerity, to which terms like direct expression, tears, and sincerity were formative. The novels were, in the author's reading, his first attempt at a direct utterance about our life, <coughs> and literature and experience that can, okay, let me read the original, that Вы зовёт у вас искренние слёзы, салонаватый привкус, который вернёт вам чувство реального. These and other auto comments boast a sentimental rhetoric, and that rhetoric cannot be isolated from Sarokin's um, a shift in Sarokin's personal and professional um, uh, social uh, immersion in the years. Sarokin increasingly engaged with people from Russia's music scene in the late 1990s. I interviewed him in 2009 and he then explained, explained this change in poetics with a shift in his personal contacts from conceptualist circles to, I'm citing him, musicians and cinema and theatre people. He deemed, he told me that he thought the language of sincerity was especially fit for music, which does not need intermediaries. And citing him again, in music, должна быть какая-то сентиментальность, какая-то транзитивная чувственность. 
Indeed, Sorokin was at his most overtly sentimental when commenting his first opera libretto in 2005. He emphasized the interviews. Никакой не постмодернизм. Она очень трогательная и у нормальных людей вызывает искренние и высокие чувства. Мне хотелось написать человеческую трогательную историю. Получается очень человеческая история. Думаю, она будет пролита мимо слез. Мне кажется, она получилась довольно трогательная, как и опера в целом, и в конце вызывает слезы и сочувствия. And my old favorite, я лично дважды прослезился. Moving, sincere, crying, in typifying his new work, Sorokin could not move further from the stereotypical view of the coolly analytical postmodernist. This personalizing move was not unique among conceptualists at the time, but Sorokin's shift towards the emotive personal sphere was particularly conspicuous. He started making multiple media appearances, which foregrounded his private rather than professional life. Um, if you read early Sarukin interviews, you see that they tackle literary technical themes, but now he began mentioning and showing family members, these are his daughters, expressing political views and using tropes of honesty and openness. I mean it, that truly excites me. In 2009, he launched a blog in which he frequently debated with readers uh, his views on, say, politics or food. So these initiatives all bolstered the same message. Rather than the inscrutable early Sarokin, this was the real writer opening up to readers. So for my book, I studied this, you know, his media appearances, his comments on his work, and I also studied his visual self-presentation in the 2000s, and there I noticed that the same message pervaded. His media appearances from that period onwards have been at times downright intimate. We are treated to glamorous photo sessions in domestic settings and occasionally we catch glimpses of his naked chest and legs uh, and to online videos in which he leisurely enjoyed vodka or good food. Illustratively, this, this is really a key uh, example from the audiovisual sphere. Now, has anyone here ever accidentally seen this video? Yeah, I, I did. Okay, you did, you did, yeah. So it's a video, you may remember that, which revives the classic trope of the grand writer opening up to his audience. Viewers see Sarokin, you can see that in these screenshots, dressed in white in his birch filled garden and wooden study, portrait of Tolstoy at hand. That's a small Tolstoy portrait that he's holding there. <coughs> he firmly criticizes city life and current politics, and he occasionally employs, again, outright sentimental rhetoric. He says, I simply love to wander through the forest and touch the trees with my hands. So we see, in short, in this video, a writer with capital W. Um, admittedly, and you may remember this too, if you've seen it, the makers revisit this trope with some irony. The, the video has the somewhat, well, the series in which it appeared has the somewhat corny title, Outstanding and even very outstanding representatives of the scanty masters of culture tribe. So there's some irony on that trope here. And at one point, I don't know if you've seen it or missed it, but Sarokin's dogs are shown copulating, uh, so uh, having sexual intercourse. But the classical grand Russian writer motif does resonate with force throughout the clip. In fact, as I explain in the book, together the comments and images in this clip, and I'm being very short about this here, but I'm saying a bit more about it in the book, tangibly evoke Ilya Repin's uh, famous portrait of Tolstoy. So this grand classic version of Sarokin shares very little with the stereotypical distant ironic postmodernist. Not surprisingly, Sarokin's work and public appearances of the 2000s have been evoking very heated debates regarding performativity, celebrification, and artistic integrity. And please don't repeat them here, because I often give this talk and then afterwards people tell me, but surely you don't believe this. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not interested in saying whether or not I believe this. I very much sympathize with what Sarokin is doing, but the question whether he's serious or not is very complex and I'm not going to try to answer it. So in these debates, sincerity and anxieties occupied center stage. Some critics rejoiced at the honest expression, I'm, I'm citing some people here, I didn't put in the, the original citations here, at the honest expression of Sorokin's true voice and the new sincerity that allowed him to finally be himself. So this is in part a citation uh, from Lev Danilkin uh, and Dmitry Bavlisky. Others read the trilogy as an attempt to exploit the crisis of postmodernism and charm the masses with a genuine authorial voice. So he's someone saying, wait, we're being tricked. When Sarokin protested against skeptical readings, commentators said, well, this is just another postmodern gesture. 
The brilliant stylist, I'm citing Maya Kuczewska, threw his audience another bone and publicly enacted the role of the critic. So that's what she said uh, about his moves. The question to what extent the trilogy expressed Sarokin's true voice was, as you see, occupying critics, but it also occupied literary scholars. Mark Lipovetsky critically mapped the work's reception, but extended its real or fake topos by calling it a non-ironic attempt to truly recreate traditionalist discourse. Maria Bondarenko, after unraveling, so what Maria Bondarenko did was she first unraveled existing interpretations of the works and their preoccupation with sincerity, and then she linked Lyot to a new sentimentalism in poetry, which embraced the tension between deconstruction and a breakthrough of sincerity. Dirk Uffelmann wondered, are we to believe Sarokin's self-reception in interviews? But then he concluded, um, like me, <laughs> that the question, is the trilogia parodic or not, need not be solved. So, fake or real, that question pervaded the novel's reception history. So, like I said before, I'm not interested, like Dirk Uffelmann, in answering the question, is all of this fake or real, but I'm interested in the larger discussion that that question plays in the, uh, on the realities of post-Soviet artistic life, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so I'm returning to my three phases here. As I said before, in the earlier post-Soviet years, discussions about sincerity were, in many cases, also discussions about social trauma. We saw that when Prigov pleaded for a new sincerity, he was thinking about the question how to deal with the past. In the 2000s, Russian writers, artists and critics kept wondering how to revive sincerity, but they now moved from the question how to deal with the past towards another query, and that was the query how to deal with the present. And that question is imperative to the reception of the trilogy. Sorokin wrote it around the turn of the century when, as has often been discussed, post-Soviet authors faced a new social setting where literature played an increasingly marginal role. So the, all of this has been discussed elsewhere, but what I'm interested in is that in this complex socio-economic landscape, Sarokin chose to adopt a more public-oriented self-presentation. So once again, I think your starting comment is very interesting here, because clearly marketing and sincerity are not, at least not entirely isolated from one another in, in the story about Sarokin. And Sarokin did so not only rhetorically. The same author who earlier claimed not to take a reader as such into account, this is an, a Sarokin citation, I think that's what he said in the early 1990s, the same author now launched his work with popular publisher Zakharov and actively promoted it in public. And with success, when I asked him, he told me that from the early 2000s onwards he could easily live off his writings. So it, it's literally paid, uh, he was literally paid better in, uh, from this period onwards. So not surprisingly, the one million dollar question in the trilogy's reception was that of commodification. Critics wondered, was Sarokin's switch to an outspokenly sincere self-presentation? Was that literarily or socio-economically motivated? Was he embracing an alternative artistic approach or was he aiming for larger audiences and by implication for higher book sales? Mikhail Riklin um, plainly blamed his former friend for selling out and for turning his work into a mere commodity. And the novels also led to more complex considerations of the interaction between sincerity and commerce. I pasted two examples here by Igor Smirnov, who said, well, ICE is a sequel whose dreariness <coughs> is mocking, I'm citing him, consumer society, which is forced to buy the same goods today as it purchased yesterday. And my, my last example is Ilya Kukulin, who discusses a tension between Sarokin's new sincere interests and the trilogy's status as an intellectual bestseller calculated to gain quick success. And that's the end of this citation. Um, so in these and other reviews of the trilogy, what we see is a persistent focus on socio-strategic considerations. And we see that same focus in debates on other post-Soviet authors and artists who uh, adopt a sincere or new sincere self-fashioning. So Dmitry Vadenikov is one example. Alek Kulik, their critics and viewers and readers are uh, very actively wondering, is, is, is this sincerity real or is it simply a marketing strategy? Um, so what I try to show in the book is that these questions are not new but that they follow a long-standing tradition. Here you see a book by literary historian Susan Rosenbaum 
who says there is, I'm just going to read from the PowerPoint, he can see a culture of sensibility extending from roughly the mid 18th and 18th century to the present in which the practice of writing for a literary marketplace generates a recurrent anxiety about whether authors can be trusted, resulting in a paradoxical desire for a deep skepticism of sincerity's rhetorical forms. And Rosenbaum demonstrates that in Anglo-American lyric, this trend to contest sincerity, that it heightens at times of radical changes in the literary field. We see that in Russian literary history. Um, uh, my colleague Jochen Klein has shown that literary commercialization, for instance, prompted Gavrila Dejavin to embrace a late 18th century cult of sincerity. And there, readers also ask the question, is Dejavin being sincere or is he simply trying to uh, flatter, uh, um, um, flatter the authorities, is he simply trying to sell his work? So Dejavin was an example. Post-Soviet Russia is another case in point. Debates on a new, or worries about a new authorial sincerity resurfaced precisely when the Soviet Union's collapse forced authors to embrace new socio-economic coping strategies. And as you saw, it was then that critics and scholars eagerly linked authors' literary decisions with possible market-oriented considerations. Now, um, we are sort of in the second half of my talk, nearing the end, but there's one slightly technical or theoretical subtlety that I want you to bear with me a little bit to think about that, because there's an interesting theoretical problem or... <coughs> Um, problem at work in, in this discussion. As you may have noticed, uh, most of Sorokin's reviewers did not simply ask, is this writer sincere or not? So they, they did not, most of the people whom I cited here are not thinking in rigid A or B schemas. As most critics, and I think also students, knowing my own students today, they appear to be perfectly aware, of, well, perfectly uh, wary, uh, to be quite wary of hard binary oppositions. And they appear to be perfectly aware that in commercial culture, citing Rosenbaum, sincerity and performance are indistinguishable practices. So some of his professional readers were intrigued by the fake or real question that his trilogy and its presentation evoked, but they rarely sought to erase that tension entirely. So they were perceptive to the interweavings of sincerity and performance. And this perceptivity was fueled by I think by a booming of literary sociology and by a then near obsessive interest in uh, Pierre Bourdieu's theories. Um, I, let me also please just check who here does not know Bourdieu, and it's perfectly fine if you don't. But yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I wish to check that. So Pierre Bourdieu, no one who says never heard of that name. Mm -hmm. I heard once. Sorry? Uh, you asked about who heard of Houdon. Who doesn't, who didn't hear about him? Yeah. Uh, Russia, everybody knows. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that, that's my point. I just wanted to double check. Um, and you see this too. You see in the same volume in which uh, Smirnov, for instance, reads Sarokin in socio-economic terms, in that same volume he explicitly defends Bourdieu's literary sociology. Um, now, of course, for many of the things that I'm saying, I'm not <coughs> trying to say that Russia is unique in many of these cases. And um, pro Bourdieu please resounded elsewhere at the same time too, not only in Russia. In fact, I know that this book uh, would not have existed if I hadn't mentioned, hadn't dropped Bourdieu's name in a proposal to fund the research. I know that, because <laughs> I read the feedback. Uh, but I would argue that literary sociology stirred a special chord here in Russia at the time. In post-Soviet Russia, this so literary sociology was the perfect theoretical tool to analyze a literary scene in radical socio-economic transition. Inevitably, this new socio-literary theoretical language then impacted on the language that critics like Smirnov and Kukulin use, and on Russian discussions of artistic sincerity at large. So what I'm trying to say is, in a setting where cultural and economic capital were on the tip of everyone's tongue, sincerity rhetoric inevitably became an object of theoretical controversy. It, it was only logical that people started wondering about what it means to be sincere. Um, so with that small excursion into Russian Bourdieu-Vedinia, I don't know if there's such a term. I want to conclude this summary of, my, uh, of, of the chapter in which I want to zoom in, of the second chapter. But what I hope to show you was how this story flags a change in the post-Soviet infatuation with artistic sincerity. Um, so I wanted to show you how that second phase that I'm outlining, how it worked. So after earlier conceptualizations of sincerity as a poetic cure for the Soviet trauma, 
sincere expression in this second phase is foregrounded in a different debate, that of dealing with the present and the socio-economic challenges faced by writers in post-communist society. So that's phase two. Now, in the early 2000s, commercialization concerns begin to make way for a third and last sincerity concern. And this concern is related to the questions, let me see, yeah, that Mombert raises with the video that he shares on YouTube. The, this film by Mombert uh, not only comments on social and economic competition in the art world, so that's the topic that interested readers of Sarokin, but also on, he's also commenting on mediatization. His video forces us to think about the question of what does it mean to be sincere in a thoroughly mediatized and digitized world. And uh, I mean, I haven't done any personal anecdotes elsewhere in this story, but um, in my own home uh, setting, I had a very interesting moment where I found myself needing to think about that question too, where our cat died, uh, and my daughter was six, uh, was very sad, and so she cried, um, and while she was crying, she sort of suddenly realized that that would make a really good uh, short uh, little film. So while she was crying, she asked me, Mom, can we please uh, film my crying? And that's one moment where I thought, yeah, I'm not sure when I was a child whether I would have asked that question. So the, the mediatization of emotions is, is quite ubiquitous at the moment. So that's what I look at in the last chapter of my book. And there we see how critics are pondering the nexus between sincere expression and new technologies, especially media technologies. Um, in the past two decades here in Russia, a new generation of writers and bloggers, like uh, FIPI 754, have engaged in increasingly vivid discussions about this topic. This blogger is very brief about it, of course, but there are other people who spend much, uh, much more words uh, on the same topic. So to these new voices in the debate, the Soviet trauma and the transition to a capitalist economy are, of course, not irrelevant. But what feeds their sincerity anxieties most is our relationship to news media, social media and mobile media. They operate in a complex mediascape, one where the propaganda-ridden Soviet media empire collapsed, but where the authorities do engage in new forms of semi-authoritarian media modeling. Yeah, I'm trying to find a sort of subtle way to talk about the mediascape in, in Putin's Russia. Uh, so, of course, there, there is such a thing as intervention from the authorities in media usage in Russia today, but it's very different from the Soviet era. Um, and bloggers like uh, Flippy 754 many others to use social media as bottom-up publishing tools to express their thoughts on sincere behavior online. Now, in my third chapter, I follow the many online commentators that share their say on sincere behavior today. And before concluding, I just very briefly Ah, I see I've moved to my new slide. I really want to say what I showed there. Um, I talk about people who claim, like André Lachac did some time ago in a much-read article on the website Kulta, that digital media are more conducive to sincere expression and social commitment than broadcast media have ever been. So some say with social media we are more or less living in a more sincere age. <coughs> Journalist Mar Marina Mitriona, Mitrionina said this in the early 2000s, for instance, say no, new technologies lead to dehumanization. And this is a trend that we need to counter by practicing sincere writing within online uh, media. Sincere, imperfect, or non polished <coughs> writing. Um, and I put the word imperfect in just to build a little bridge because in my new research I'm looking at this, um, the way in which people think about imperfection in response to digitization and uh, changes in media usage, but that's another story. Um, yet others simply use new sincerity rhetoric in uh, constructing a social identity online by labeling more or less anything from, you know, we've seen the Starbucks visitors to check at some addresses to a new Bach recording uh, as emblems of a new sincerity. So, in my last chapter I've tried to track these online voices um, and I've tried to do more than simply describe what they do. In that last chapter uh, I'm also pointing a somewhat angry finger at colleagues from especially the US and the UK I'm trying to plead for more transcultural sensitivity in the transnational academic debate on new, reality, new media, reality and honesty. What you see is that scholars like Neil Gabler, Nancy Bain, who are all based in the UK and the US, they've done much to help us understand how 
you know, media work in today's society, but when they do that, they always write analyses that claim that they have universal legitimacy, but they focus on exclusively Western examples. And in my last chapter, I'm trying to also reach out to scholars like them and to say, well, if you look at the picture, the Russian picture, the post-Soviet picture, then your findings are being complicated. Um, what you see, for instance, is that uh, Nancy Bain uh, talks about mediatization and authenticity. She says, well, uh, in, in the age of new media, people are searching for a new authenticity that they've lost. But I think that we see what we see in Russian discussions, and I'd be very interested also in hearing your thoughts about this. What we see much more than discussions about authenticity, <coughs> probably you would translate that with bodliness in, in Russian, um, and I, I try to think about that term a little bit in the book, um, is that you see discussions where um, people talk about the impact of new media on our lives by using the term sincerity, iskrenost. So this term authenticity, I would say, is much less pertinent in Russian debates. And that has an impact on what people are actually saying in the debates, because talking about authenticity is not the same as talking about sincerity. So those were a few words on my last chapter um, and on the last uh, phase that I discussed in the book. And I want to conclude my talk with, with that last phase um, and with a few words on, um, well, as a sort of sort of BS, the only thing that I want to say is that in the past months I've been expanding my work on the book by linking my findings to politics, to recent political developments. So, so that's, there's much less of that in the book, although there is some, some politics there, but um, I've been expanding that in, in this blog post and also in an upcoming article in, in the next issue of Niprikasnar and Nizapas, I'll have a, a Russian article on this topic. What I've started examining is, um, or what I've started claiming is that the study of sincerity matters very much in times of disinformation, post-truth politics uh, and fake news and that Soviet history is a helpful reminder of the tricky workings of sincerity rhetoric in the political arena. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that many of you know that under Stalin accusations of a lack of sincerity could literally kill party members. So Bukharin, for instance, in the Bukharin um, uh, law, what's it called, the Bukharin trial, uh, Stalin literally said in a speech to Bukharin that it was not so much the things that he did, but the fact that he was insincere. The word iskrenist is very prominent in that speech. That it was his insincerity which made Stalin so angry and which was the reason that Bukharin needed to be punished and then Bukharin was killed. Under Trump and Putin, we again witness how political leaders simultaneously, you know, they're simultaneously manipulating, doctoring media images and using the label fake to impair political adversaries. So we see how sincerity rhetoric um, can be very tangible for concrete biographies, for concrete people in politics. We also see in contemporary politics how oppositional voices, and I'm citing Talakonikova in uh, a court speech, insist on genuine sincerity, I think the term she uses is Nastayasha Iskrenus, as the political tool that the authorities fear most. So uh, Talakonikova said in her court speech, it's our it's the, act, the, the, the real sincerity of Pussy Riot that, that's so scary to the Russian authorities. Now, if you want, we can return to this last dimension in the discussion, but for now, I'll conclude simply by reiterating uh, my main findings. So what I'm asking in my book is, what does the relentless popularity of sincerity models teach us about post-socialist society? And my answers are, I don't think I'm going to repeat them, you've seen them, are these three phases that I'm outlining, these three longings. And um, uh, I would also argue that this story that I've been sketching here is of course ongoing. The book is finished, but the story goes on. The new sincerity, I don't think that it has morphed into the new cultural mainstream that some uh, believed it to be earlier, but dreams of reviving sincerity are still very alive today. And I want to conclude um, on that note. Thanks. And your questions are very well. Uh, here comes the questions. Uh, question, I mean, yeah. Do we have some questions? Well, or maybe suggestions. Yes. I, yeah, yeah, ideas. Uh, yeah. As far as we're talking about, uh, so first of all, thank you so much. And as far as we're talking about these very delicate issues, 
can you open some secrets about your own discourse in terms of sincerity, taboo? Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm talking not so much about your personal life, but okay. as well also. <laughs> okay. We all know that academic establishment has certain rules, at least some concepts in Russia that you, you also have it. So could you open and reveal the secrets, what you're allowed and not allowed to say in the democratic Western world? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to understand precisely what you mean. So you're not trying to say, how do I deal, for instance, with media and sincerity? No, no, what I would like to know more is, do you feel any limitations uh, in order to say something if you belong to a certain environment, a certain media, well, which you definitely do? Yeah, in the very recent past, I think especially with populism in, in uh, Western Europe, um, there's a big discussion going on in the Netherlands today. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's linked literally to new sincerity, but it's certainly related to the question, do you say what you really mean, in, in social media especially. I did notice that um, when you talk about, um, well, for instance, when you talk about Russia, when I talk about Russia in my work, uh, there is a relatively large group of people right now, and luckily I'm sort of, they're not really targeting me that much, they did it once on Twitter. Um, but they think that all academics in the humanities are leftist, and therefore they hate Putin, and therefore all universities are, um, I don't know, Bolwerk is the Dutch word, I don't know how to say it in Russian, but uh, universities are these sort of, you know, uh, breeding grounds of anti-Russian sentiments. And the funny thing is that in my work I'm constantly asking for more nuance about Putin too, and about Russia, and not because I'm pro Putin, but just because the Dutch media are horrible about Russia, and very stereotypical. Uh, but once I wrote something where they could say, ah, look, there's a leftist academic who is there. I certainly <laughs> noticed that I'm careful in what I say on Twitter, but I'm not sure if that's what you meant. Yeah, it's sort of. It's also very interesting. I don't know how, how much you're really aware of that, but in fact, almost all Russian, uh, as you call, like wild capitalistic uh, thinkers and think tanks, they all form communists. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, it's incredibly okay. interesting that you mentioned yeah. all that people who immigrated from Russia who former war pioneers, whatever, and how they changed their rhetoric in a couple of years. Yeah. This is something very deep about trauma. Mm -hmm. So basically then foreigners, or let's say Westerners, they talk about trauma, they talk about trauma in kind of huge conceptualized mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's mostly about very certain traumatized people. No, I'm very who really, yeah. who really yeah. mostly, they associate yeah. themselves with the opposite side yeah. in a couple of so yeah, I, I noticed in, in, in the discussions, for instance, about the conflict in Ukraine, that there were many people, um, um, these were indeed not theoretical discussions, uh, but just plain responses by newspaper readers, uh, that people were very worried about what the authorities were telling them, uh, also pro-Kremlin journalists, but also politicians, because the, they would say, you know, that these people are simply being, they're even being honest about the fact that they're lying. Uh, and that's very traumatic in a very untheoretical way. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> I would like to ask you, um, after your research, how do you think uh, we are is Dutch people or Russian people more sincerity? Yeah. How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in this article in Nipikus Nanisa Pass, I'm quite uh, um, <laughs> Uh, direct about that. Uh, I don't believe in Russian souls or in Russians being more sincere than others. I think there is a difference in how eagerly people use the term sincerity, and I think especially after Pomerantsev and this essay of Christi Literature, but, but also already in the 19th century in discussions about Russia versus the West, mm -hmm. um, that term iskrenost uh, somehow pops up very often in. Russian talk about social identity. So the term is very popular. Um, and I don't think either Russians or Dutch, some Dutch people are horribly insincere and some Russian people are horribly insincere and some are wonderfully sincere in both countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Why have you chosen this theme? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, when I wrote my first book, which was about political gender metaphors, uh, I stumbled upon poems by Timur Kubinov. Uh, I was then simply interested in his poems about Russia, and then I, was, I started reading things about Kibirev, and I started reading Epstein's uh, thoughts on how Kibirev would exemplify new sincerity. Uh, and at first I was simply very moved when I read that. I thought, oh, that, you know, 
first I started reading Sarokin, that was even earlier, and then I was very moved by Sarokin. I thought, oh, that's really a very interesting way, a very beautiful way of dealing with the Soviet trauma. And then I started reading Epstein, and I thought, oh, but that's a beautiful next step. So then I was very enthusiastic, and then I thought, ah, but enthusiasm is always bad as food for <laughs> theory, so I decided to drop it. Uh, but then I kept on tracking usage of that phrase, new sincerity, and I'm critical, and started looking at this whole debate with more distance, and then I thought, no, I want to, I want to know more about this, so I want to understand what it means. I guess also in my own life I'm also worried about whether I'm sincere or not, and I guess I'm worried about that in a different way than my grandmother would be, because I live in a different society, where you always have to pitch yourself, you have to do this as a journalist, I have to constantly do this as an academic. Uh, media are, like I said, very important, so I'm searching for the right way to use social media and be able to be sincere. So I guess these were things that personally intrigued me, but when I noticed that I could drop my enthusiasm, I decided that I could write about this. Yeah. And it will be also a Russian translation of the book, right? Yes, I just told you, yes, I'm going to uh, talk to a publisher tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So there should be a Russian translation. Well, I, talked about I, I have also a very short question, if it's possible. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Britain, uh, and uh, you mentioned also British uh, media scale. Yeah. And I was really impressed, because not so long time ago, I guess about two months, The Guardian, mentioned that they are in crisis <coughs> and they don't have any more money or supporters, whatever. So could you a little bit describe as you see uh, the situation with uh, paper and digital media in general in the Western world? Because something is going on mm. and it's probably... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on there. It doesn't look very good, uh, honestly yeah, speaking. I, I can so, share my thoughts, but they yeah. will be my own, you know, um, informal thoughts. But I, I'm, I'm not really studying that situation as a whole. Um, I do know that the whole transition to uh, digital media, um, I guess, well, the one thing that I can say about it that's also relevant to, to the book is that the, the, the competition between print and social media does mean that journalists, like you say, very much have to pitch their stories and very much have to make sure that readers actually want to read what they write. And therefore what we call, I guess, what is the English word, human resource journalism. So journalism with human stories, uh, you know, sincerely uh, authentic Russian people in Siberia, for instance, uh, they sell well and therefore journalists are sort of forced to think about how, how their journalism can be sincere. I don't know if that's the right term. Um, I, I do see that. But I guess that's as far as I would go because there's so much more to say about this topic. Uh, your theme is uh, sincerity after communism, but you speak only about uh, Russia, and how is it about uh, yes. the other countries? Uh, yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, I, I say a little bit about that in, in the introduction, that uh, um, I take my case studies from Russia, uh, but if you look at other post-communist countries, then um, you also see uh, quite a vivid engagement with that idea of a new sincerity. Um, I found, for instance, Bulgarian examples where people talk about a new sincerity in the Bulgarian context. There was a big show at the Tate Modern by Chinese contemporary artists which was called In Search of a New Sincerity, which was supposed to be a post-Mao sincerity. <coughs> so the picture is larger, uh, but for practical reasons, because I'm a Russianist, uh, I decided to focus, and because I could only write one book on, on Russia, but it's a good story. Well, and, of course, uh, another uh, dimension that's important to realize is that I talk, I say that I'm talking about Russia, but uh, some of the people that I talk about are in fact from Ukraine or uh, from other post-Soviet states. Um, so the story is larger than that, but I use Russian as an umbrella term. Thanks. Um, I had a question. You, you, you mentioned that you have you phrase your, your theme as, as the influence of this new sincerity on, um, on artistic life, on cultural life. Could you share some thoughts on how you, how you see the interaction between this artistic cultural life and, and the rest of society? So how do, they, ah. how, how do they relate to one another? So because of course, I mean, you, you sometimes touch a little bit on, on society at large, but most of mm -hmm. it is indeed on artists. And yeah. Yeah, good question. Well, in any case, it's not an isolated uh, 
part of society, it's also part of politics, I guess, that's, that's how I would see it. So politics, and I, I said I think at the end that I, I've only started recently exploring politics, but of course politics and, and cultural life are, are, you know, are, are intertwined constantly. Uh, I guess the reason, it's a good question, because it, I sometimes find it hard to use the right words. I've also been searching very long for the term that I want to use for the people whom I explore. At some point I started calling them cultural workers, <laughs> because I don't only uh, write about writers uh, and artists, but also designers and marketeers. Um, uh, and then I thought, ah, but that sounds a bit odd, uh, also in the post-Soviet sphere with the workers and the word labour. And then I thought maybe creative professionals, but creative professionals is very celebratory, celebratory. So in the end, I do use the word creative professionals uh, because it's broader than uh, culture or art, but I, I have a big disclaimer about it in the beginning of the book where I try to explain it's hard to find the right term. Uh, so I've been searching for the right words. The reason that I often use the word culture or art or writing is that most of the people that <coughs> in my talk are artists, visual artists, literary writers, designers, uh, but it's a bit blurry. So I don't mind talking about, uh, I don't know, uh, well, somebody who's not active in, in uh, cultural industries at all. I, I hope this answers your very good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to, to make one sort of clear picture because I sometimes go beyond the borders of what you might call the cultural scene. And, and political correctness? Did you ever think about that in the context of... Certain. Yeah, yeah, I do write about it, but uh, I also think that in the past year, especially when the book was already almost finished, it became such a big topic again. Yeah, also you will notice in the Netherlands, uh, it's huge um, that it, it, that topic really grew in my thoughts about sincerity, and there's not that much about it in the book, but there's more about it in this um, in this blog post. You can read it online; it's very short. Be done in five minutes. <laughs> um, but I've started thinking about it here, and in the Nipli Kassan uh, article, I say a little bit about it too. I don't use the term political correctness, though, and I think there could be, there's more to say about it than I do. Questions? Yeah. yeah, maybe if I can just very briefly ask you a question, and that's uh, a collective question. If there's anyone who disagrees with me that in this Russian, um, that Russian bloggers are more likely to use the term iskrenes than uh, Russian alternatives for the word authenticity, I'm very happy to hear, because that's an idea that I've tried to test before, but I'm always happy to hear if you think, no, there's, there's a translation for that word that you just don't know about. And people I think it really depends on the context. You can't really say that, well, it means iskrenes for authenticity. Of course, yeah. If it's an yeah. academic discourse or something, authenticity is more likely to be used. And how would you translate authenticians? Authenticians. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is why then that sort of confirms my point because I'm looking to a large extent at popular uh, references to the term Norway uh, iskrenest and uh, relatively higher educated bloggers. Well, relatively. Uh, I don't mean relatively higher educated, but higher educated bloggers who are not super immersed in uh, uh, critical theory do use the term Norway iskrenest, but they wouldn't use Norway authenticianist because it's too jargonistic. Mm -hmm. But of course, in academic debate, yes. And nowhere podliness also somehow seems to have maybe too much of a legal connotation. I'm not sure if that's you, the You can invent a new term. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the last thing I really think. It's not legal, it's just too literal. Maybe also, yeah, too literal probably. Yeah, about authentic handwriting or well, yeah. We also have a kind of a conflict between uh, you know, long words and uh, Russian terms. Sometimes you can see someone use a word that sounds really strange in Russian just because they're more used to reading in English. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, which is why I teach this. Thanks. Um, the question <laughs> uh, Do you find uh, the equality between the new sincerity and the new Russian identity? Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you mean, could you speak of a new Russian social identity, also yes. top-down, do you mean, yes. like maybe Putinist identity and the new sincerity? Yes, well, there are people who say there, there is such a link. Uh, um, uh, what's his name, Dmitry Galinka, the, the poet, uh, he, he certainly uh, sees such a link. 
And I also remember that either Lefkowitz Dean or Sergei Galevsky uh, talked to me about this and said, you know, uh, they were very bitter about it. Too. They said, gosh, we started mm -hmm. talking about sincerity, but it's more or less stolen by the authorities. Uh, and uh, I even believe there are, um, there have been also some politicians who've been using that phrase, new sincerity, in, in very mm -hmm. um, unsettling contexts. So they sort of borrow that language. So, so there is there is a link. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ellen, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you